Welcome back to Curly Boy Theater, everyone. Um, next up, we have Vibhu Agarwal to talk to us about Python web community. Um, Vibhu is a student, a Pythonista, and an open source enthusiast. He likes to play around with web servers and sometimes clients. On weekends, you can find him in one or the other meetups or conferences discussing about snakes and unicorns or other tech stuff mostly in local tech groups like Pi Delhi or Django London. Vibhu is joining us today all the way from India. Uh, welcome, Vibhu. Uh, the talk is pre-recorded today, uh, so Vibhu will be in the chat, so you can talk to him and ask him questions in the chat. Is there anything you'd like to say before we get started, Vibhu? Hey, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's having a good time. And uh, I think there will be a few questions, so do post them in the chat and I'll answer them somewhere in the text chat or even in the hallway video chat, if you'd like. So let me know. Hey everyone, what is going on, especially in Python web? Now people trying out web development in Python, whether they've had experience in some other language or they're trying out for the first time ever, they do find quite a lot of things to get started with and do it very easily. Now, as the target moves towards creating a production-ready website, a lot of moving parts get added up into our tech stack. Today, we're going to discuss all about those moving parts, what those tools are, how are they compatible with each other, how do they work together, and try, we'll try to understand all of them as a whole and not just individual components. My name is Vibhu. Uh, I'm, I live in India. I've been using Python for four years and have been involved in loads of web-related projects in the last three years. Okay, let's start with basics. Where we have a client, we have a server. Client, a client and server establish a TCP connection between them. Client requests uh, in HTTP using an HTTP request. Server responds with an HTTP response. Pretty much it. Talking about static websites, client would request a particular uh, HTML file which would be residing on the server side. And so it, they will tell, they will tell maybe tell the path in the in the HTTP path. Uh, and they were, and what the server would do is to embed the content of HTML file into the HTTP response and then return the response back. But in the case if we want to store some information into a database or maybe or maybe we want to calculate some manipulate some data and return some complex uh, query a query back, we'd want to do it do it not in a static website. We can't do it in a static website. We'd want to do it using a dynamic website. In a dynamic website, what we do is to load an external script pass the inputs which we received in the HTTP request into the uh, external script. The external script then processes the in these inputs and then returns a response back. Nowadays, you can do, you can write your external script in pretty much any language and that's a good thing to have. Now, what if we want to have a hybrid kind of, kind of a structure in which we want to support both the dynamic and static content? So we need a server which would redirect the request from uh, in the static content from the static content and it would direct to the backend server as well. That is that is which are which is serving the extra which is serving the dynamic content. So I've seen a lot of projects which use Nginx as the as the middle server which redirects the request. So whenever it, requ it receives a request which would, which is uh, fetching for which is going to fetch for static content, it will redirect to the static files and it receive and if it receives a request which which needs a dynamic content, it redirects the request to the backend server so based on based on the kind of request it redirects the request now nginx is capable of doing a lot more than just redirecting the request but i've seen a lot of python related projects which have a tech stack which include nginx for particularly this task but today we're going to focus on this thing right now that is our backend server or our application server now the main task or the first task which we see for the application server is to receive or listen to a lot of requests. How about a reserve? How about we reserve a process just for listening to the requests? And we denote this particular circle over here as our process which would just listen to the request and do nothing else. So a request a request would be coming along and this process would, this main process would be listening to all of those requests. Now, once it, it has the, these requests, it needs to parse that request. It needs to understand that request. It needs to break it, break it down into different tokens so that they know what is the, what are the inputs of the HTTP request and so that they can process and then do some action based on those inputs. Now, 
we talked about that this backend server loads the external script. This loading of external script happens through forking. Now we discussed that we, we, are, we are reserving a main process on the backend server to just to listen to the request. Now what this main process does is whenever it receives a request, it creates it creates a, or forks a new forks a new process. This that fork process loads the external script from the disk and keeps it up into the memory. And then the inputs of uh, inputs of the HTTP request are passed to the uh, external script or the fork process, which would then process the uh, request and then returns the response back. Now this kind of flow or structure is uh, discussed in this uh, RFC that is CGI common gateway interface in which they discuss how to load and execute the external script but they also discuss how to pass in the inputs or uh, the request variables into the fork process. This happens through environment variables. So whenever request arrives, the main process listens to the request then uh, breaks it down, passes the request and then or puts all of the HTTP inputs into its environment. And once the fork process is created, it inherits those environment variables from the parent process. And once the script is loaded, for, loaded into the memory, the script loaded script would then pick up those inputs from the environment, process these, process these inputs, and then return the response back. So that's what that's basically CGI. Okay, let's no, uh, notice that we are doing a fork. Now, fork as some people might have heard is, is a heavy thing because that involves a system call. Also, loading the external script from the disk is a system call and that is slow. Now, the, these are the two tasks which are not related to one or any particular request and you might not even want to do it, do it because you, what you want to just want to do is to just pass the request and return the response back by running the script and you don't want the external overhead of forking a new process and loading the script from the from the disk into the memory. To deal with this, we adopt what we know as pre-fork model. So what we do is whenever we set up our backend server, they spin up a few processes in advance, which load the external script into the memory in advance. So whenever a request arrives, what, what the server does is to pick up one of the process from its available pool of processes and assigns one, that request to one of one of the, uh, to that process. And then the process would just uh, execute the script and return the response back. So there is no overhead, there's no overhead of uh, uh, forking a new process and loading the script as the request arrives because that has been done previously before even the request arrives. So that saves a lot of overhead. Now, because we have introduced some uh, a lot of processes, this uh, process management feature also needs to be there at the backend server because we might want to increase or decrease the number of processes or uh, these processes which process the request uh, uh, dynamically as so as to optimize the uh, usage of resources on a side. Okay. Let's talk about this external script we keep saying about. So what, what can this external script do? Well, it can do anything because it has uh, maybe all of the permissions, but what are the common tasks? One of the common tasks would be to uh, embed their dynamic information into the HTML, which we are finally going to pass into, into the response. That is done using the templates. One other task would be to uh, map different paths to different uh, de function definition or we, what we usually call as URL dispatches. So, for, uh, so mapping one path to its respect to its corresponding function or URL dispatcher is uh, known as routing. This is one of the common tasks as well, and a lot of other tasks which might which you must not have seen web developers doing because these all common tasks are separated out in a separate tool what we know as in what we know as web frameworks now python web community might be familiar with web frameworks in the form of django or flask or fast api and a lot of other web frameworks which exist in the community now flask is as a micro framework it helps us because it helps us helps us to micromanage our applications so over here we're just uh, importing the flask instantiating the flask and then de defining our path or url so what is happening over here so what is happening is that you're defining or you're writing your business logic in your url dispatches or your functions somewhere in your code and what 
the web framework is doing is forming a layer around your business logic. So whenever a request arrives, your web framework forms the front line of for receiving that request. It executes some code and then passes that result to your business logic, which it then uh, processes it and then produces some result. This result is handed back to the um, web framework and the web framework would then may or may not perform some exit operations and then return the response back. So that's how the web framework forms a layer around your business logic and ha handles and forms a front line and, and it may uh, intercept the request somewhere as well because it may um, just receive the request and then send it back after performing some operation and not even hand it to your business logic based on the, depending on the implementation of web framework. Moving on. Django is a very mature web framework. It has been there for a long, long time. It has a great community and is one of my favorite, favorite web frameworks. So, so Django is, uh, as they say, batteries included as they provide a lot of features. And one of the common, common, uh, common lot, a lot of features have been provided using the use of middlewares. So uh, if, if you've not used Django, what middleware does is they form extra layers between your web framework and your business logic. So once the web framework receives the request, it passes the request or result uh, after performing some code, uh, after executing some code, it passes the result to the first middleware layer and the then it executes some code and then passes the result back to the uh, then it passes the co the result to the next layer and then find, so finally it hands it to your business logic. Now you, now the business logic uh, then executes some code and then hands the result in the reverse order back. So that's how your middlewares work in Django. And this is this, and this way it, it adds up to a lot of features in your entire system. Okay. We discussed discuss about our application server and a lot of uh, people must must have heard this app about this application server in the form of GUnic on a UWSGI. Now, before discussing these, let's just quickly discuss about this WSGI or what people say as WSGI. So, what is this thing? Because this thing comes a lot of uh, comes up a lot in uh, in our development. So remember the CGI that how the, how the which uh, which is an RFC which states how to load and execute the Snow script. Well, WSGI or WSGI went one step further in stretching the CGI further and maybe restricting restricting or restricting it and uh, restricting restricting it even further in in the way to how to invoke that external script. What this what Wizgi say is to we're going to have two different things. One is the server and one is that external script. They sh they should be kind of independent from each other. And how can we be made independent of each other? So if one part knows what is expected from the other and what is expecting of them, then they can be kind of independent of each other and can be developed. Uh, independently and they can be working independently so okay if that didn't make much sense let's uh, let's quickly look at code so what whiskey states is that the external script should be prototyped into a one function what is usually known as an application that application would receive two parameters and then it sh it should return uh and it should return one value so the first uh, input which it receives is environment, which is a dictionary or hash map of environment variables. The second input is a function, which it has to call somewhere in its uh, in its code. So what is it's expecting is to receive two parameters. One is to receive the HTTP resta responses status, which you're which going to finally pass uh, uh, pass back. And the second is the response headers, but that is that is the HTTP response headers, which you are finally going to pass back. And finally, you go, you have to return the body of the response back if there is any. And middle somewhere in between all of this, you will write your code, your business logic. Now remember the Flask code. You see this variable known as app. This is Visgi application. 
and if you go if you go and see your django projects you'll see you'll notice a wsgi or wsgi.py file and that will have this application variable this is wsgi application so what what web frameworks do is to form a wsgi application and gives gives this one object or variable back which which they, they can be uh, plugged in into any web server and this is the point because we discussed that this is the point where you're going to write your business logic what web frameworks do is to just wrap all of all of your business logic and then just plug it plug it at this point so now app forms a layer around your business logic and your web framework as a whole now so the app forms the front line of your request if the request arrives app handles it hands it off to the web framework pass it may it may pass through some middleways if there are any and then then your business logic handles it and reverse way back so yeah so the one by one part of the so this external script part is handled by the web frameworks and your business logic and the other part is our application server which are which are commonly used in the form of gunicorn and uvsd so the tasks of these application servers are pretty much everything which we discussed about application server earlier that is to pass the request and receive receive the request listen to the request and do process management so some terminologies over here what these these processes which actually handle the request we these are known as the the process which ha actually handle the request are known as worker processes and the process which just listens to the incoming request are known as master processes so these are just the, the two terminologies over here and let's quickly now summarize what we uh, saw up till now so you write your code you write your business logic along with your all of the stuff which is provided by your web framework you write all of that and that gets wrapped up into one app or app function so this external script is then passed on to the web server which may receive all which may receive some extra inputs as well for example number of workers if it, it has to set up in advance it may also receive some uh, certificate files uh, or location so that it, it can have the location of those files and once it once it know the know the about these inputs it can spin up all, all that n many number of processes in advance so whenever a request arrives it picks up one of the uh, one of the available pool of processes assigns that request to that uh, process and then the the that process executes the executes the thing and then returns the response back that's pretty much all of it over here okay now let's move on to asynchronous just a moment now asynchronous development in python in the last three or four years has seen a lot of maturity a lot of tools and a lot of libraries and a lot of frameworks have been developed using the asynchronous asynchronous development and similarly in the web world as well we've seen a lot of uh, growth in web frameworks and libraries so before moving into into those let's quickly discuss what asynchronous is so let's uh, let's take an example you are playing a cards game and you now you play your turn and now your opponent is thinking about a turn because and now because your opponent is a little bit slow and thinking about a turn what you what he thought is that you can attend a talk uh, while they are playing playing the cards game so what you essentially did is to op, to utilize your time efficiently and did some work when the other person or some other task is not directly depending on you so while you were listening to the talk your opponent thought of a good turn and then played they played their card and the as they were going to disturb you to, just to poke you to play your card play your card there was a negotiator standing and they asked your opponent to wait for a while while, while you're free once uh, once you're free you will be available back and so once you are once you are done with the talk you're happy with my uh, hopefully happy with my talk you go back to the negotiator negotiator presents you with your list 
and you see your opponent right over there you ask your opponent hey I, i'm ready to play play the turn so you go go and they you then play you and then you play your turn so this negotiator and this list kind of acts like an event loop so the task can be popped up from the list and then added uh, popped up from the list and uh, then add add then add it back by the negotiator into this list so you can uh, essentially be doing one task and then uh, if the other if the task is not really depending on you you can drop doing or processing that task and then you can pick some other task midway so that's kind of easy that's kind of asynchronous that's kind of what asynchronous is uh, and if you want to learn a bit more you can definitely check out this playlist uh, if i didn't explain it uh, properly okay Let's talk about ASCII or ASGI, Asynchronous Gateway Interface. ASCII is, is what it says as a spiritual successor to WSGI because it is it is uh, kind of a superset to WSGI and provides a lo lot more flexibility to WSGI. So as similar similar to WSGI, it states that there would there would be two parts. One would be the server. One would be the external script. They would be kind of independent of each other. And they would be developed. They, sh they should be developed uh, independently. Now, ASG introduces two new terms. One is scope. One is events. Now, scope is something which stores the information about connection. It also stores about information about HTTP request headers if you are using HTTP and and uh, the HTTP request headers in turn store some preferences about the connection. So. Now, events is are the messages which are exchanged between the web server and the application. Let's uh, look at the code to understand it even better. Again, uh, it the external scripts should be wrapped up into one callable uh, that is application. Now, notice over here that application is an async function and not a normal function. It receive it is going to receive three parameters. One one is the scope. This this would in, contain the information that is that is the same scope which we discussed just now. It is going to receive uh, contain the information about HTTP request headers and the connection or other connection information. The second parameter is the receive. This is a callable. This is an, uh, an async function which you can await and then get the message from the web server. Now, once you get your message from the web server, then you can take some action. And then once you've taken some action, then you you can return the response back using the third parameter which you received. This, this is again a callable in which which is expecting something. This is expecting another event. So event is just a small dictionary which uh, represents one message. It, it may have the, the this it, it has to contain this type key which categorizes which kind of uh, message you're returning back and that you and you can await on this send callable so now you notice that there is there is no return statement over here so you, what you can do is do it uh, on a loop and you can so with one instantiating of application you can get multiple messages and you can return multiple messages back with uh, uh, along with our asynchronous uh app we have our a lot of uh, we have we have a lot of asynchronous web frameworks as well why do we have a lot of different web frameworks other than the ones which we discussed about earlier because they are natively synchronous and natively synchronous j just can't be uh, transformed into a asynchronous that straightforward in a straightforward manner a lot of work has to be done from the scratch in, in, in if we want to develop uh fully if we want to fully optimize our resources and take full advantage of concurrency sanic is a very lightweight and fast web framework quart is something interesting if you have been using a lot of flask you definitely might want to check out quart because the apis of quart is very similar to flask fast api is a very recent web framework it's it uh, focuses on on developing the web apis Fast API is built on top of Starlet. Now, Starlet provides a lot of features which Fast API uses under the hood, and it is it is a it's a fantastic ASCII web framework which I've been using using a lot. Django Channels is 
is one of the asynchronous web framework and comes which comes under the Django project. Now Django does have some async views which it introduced I think last year. Uh, Django Django has some async views, but the whole of Django is not uh, natively built or natively asynchronously built because it, it it has been there for a lot of time and it does what it does uh, it does best in what it wants to do. But channels is is a relatively newer project and it and it is a fully asynchronous web framework. Now that was the that that is the third. Uh, that is the second side or the right side of our uh, of our a, a, of our ASCII uh, web framework. The left side is again our application servers, and we have these three as one of uh, three of the uh, most popular ASCII servers out there. Daphne is uh, again coming comes under Django project. Daphne documentation specifies that it, it is intended to be used along with Django channels, but I've seen a lot of people using Daphne with other web frameworks as well. And it seems to be just working fine. And actually, it seems to be working great. Hypercoin is developed by the creator of Quart. It, it supports HTTP 1, 2, and I think 3 as well. Uvicon is a lightning fast ASCII server and it uh, focuses on performance. And uh, this is this is the uh, Uvicon is a server which I've looked at the, at the for, of which I've looked the uh, I've looked at the code of Uvicon the most. So I know, I know a little bit about how ASCII, ASCII server works. And if you want to see a little more about the discuss, discussion, if you want to see a little more discussion about ASCII servers you can check out check out this link and the working of ASCII servers are very much similar to what how, how WSGI works so whenever a request arrives it takes it uh, it takes uh, the web server takes one of the process from its available pool of processes which will have the the ASCII app in its memory it will then uh, take a take on the request process the process the inputs and return the response back the only difference is that what WSGI does it whenever it receives multiple requests, it processes that uh, those requests serially. Even even if those requests goes for an I/O bound operation, it just uh, the the app just waits. Whereas WSGI can schedule some other task when when one of the process goes for I/O bound operation, the it can schedule some other task which WSGI intended to schedule in future before and that utilize that utilizes the resources where when nothing is dependent dependent on us or or the the application so it gives a lot it gives a better response time to all of the requests and also saves the overall time so that improves performance so that was pretty much it. And what we could take away from over here is that that we know about all of the different parts. How do they work? So let's say if uh, if you pass in some inputs and the output is not is not coming out correct, there may be some error in your business logic, and you might want to fix that fix that thing in your business logic. And if you see that uh, there's some error somewhere in your tech stack which says that uh, we we couldn't pass the HTTP request. That may be some error on the HTTP parser, which is which is which is used by the web server. You may want to file a bug report over there. And if you say if you and you think of a feature that uh, that may be used uh, commonly, you can rip, uh, you, you can ask for that feature in one of the web frameworks. And if they do not accept it, you always have the uh, luxury to create a third party uh, library, which the people can just plug in into their web frameworks, and that would just work. How did I, uh, where did I read about all of these? Uh, where did I read, read all of this? I read uh, all of this from the amazing documentation provided by all of these wonderful, wonderful projects. And these, these, these just contain all of the information which I talked about, or most of the information which I talked about today. And I'm ready for some questions now. Thank you. Okay, we're back. Uh, thank you so much for that talk, Vibhu. That was like, that was really 
helpful. I know that I'm going to rewatch that to pay attention and to learn a lot. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing what you learned uh, um, through your journey, um, through all of the web frameworks with all of us. Um, is there anything you'd like to say? Um, I think uh, I do see a few questions. So I'll take the, I'll answer them in the Curly Boy Theater chat. And I, uh, I'm glad that uh, people found it helpful. I think, I think a lot of people did. Um, thank you again. Um, so yes, you can talk to Vibis some more and ask some more questions over in the Curly Boy Theater text chat um, in the channel section. And we are going into our afternoon or time zone appropriate time of day break. Um, so we'll see you back here when I get the right tab open. It's got the right thing um, in about 45 minutes. All right. Have a nice break, everyone. Have, have, have a nice drink of water. Stretch your legs. Bye.